uh, seven years ago today. It, uh, the day that he died was not on a weekly Sabbath, but it just so happens that it uh, falls that way this year. Uh, seven years uh, is uh, sometimes used in the Bible, and, and number seven certainly, not just seven years in, in certain ways. Uh, you know, an awful lot has transpired in the world in the last seven years. The uh, communist regime in the Soviet Union has collapsed, and the Soviet Union is no more. Uh, Germany has uh, not only had the wall come tumbling down, but the uh, Germany has been reunited, something that uh, this work talked about and that Mr. Armstrong broadcast uh, and uh, spoke of for decades that happened in the last seven years. Many, many events on the world scene have transpired in the last seven years. Uh, there are a lot of things that have happened in the church in the last seven years. A lot of things that have happened, of course, in each of our lives individually in the last seven years. Some of you are have come in to the church and are sitting here, and you have done that in the last seven years, because there's some of you here, uh, not a whole lot, but there are a few of you uh, that weren't here seven years ago, that weren't in uh, the church at that time. Regardless of whether or not you were a baptized member of God's church seven years ago, or whether you have come into the church in the last seven years, uh, regardless of whether or not you ever personally uh, heard Mr. Armstrong's voice over radio or television, as did probably most of us in this room, or uh, read uh, his articles and were impacted by him personally, all of us uh, that are here all of us that are in the church are here either directly or indirectly as a result of the work that God raised up through him for a period of many decades. And uh, going back to the 1920s and the 1930s. And all of us are here as a result, directly or indirectly, uh, whether you were directly impacted uh, by the voice of Herbert W. Armstrong on the radio or later on television, or whether you were directly impacted by his articles in The Plain Truth and, and uh, other books and booklets, or whether you have come in since that time, whether your first contact with broadcast uh, was maybe one of the speakers that is on the program now, directly or indirectly, it is a part of the same work, because those who are in capacities of teaching and preaching uh, today were themselves taught directly, and all of us uh, as a church uh, are a part of the work. We are an extension of the work uh, that God began through one man and his wife uh, many years ago. In fact, uh, about uh, 65 years ago, 60, uh, over 65 years ago, as God uh, began to work with uh, those two people. Now, God's uh, church had, had certainly existed before Mr. Armstrong came along, but this work, uh, this stage of the church, uh, of which we have been a part, had its beginnings through the work that God began doing through these two people. And in many ways, we are here as a result of the commitment that Mr. Armstrong had to prove out the truth out of the Bible and to make it plain. That's where the name plain truth came from. Uh, his desire to understand and to understand the truth and to take it and to make it plain. And, of course, God didn't reveal all truth to Mr. Armstrong uh, at the very beginning. Uh, he didn't start out understanding every single thing. It didn't just come in a flash or a revelation or a vision from God. Uh, God taught Mr. Armstrong through the pages of the Bible. And... Many, many times, those of you who heard him over radio and over television uh, can recall him, or having heard him in person, uh, can recall him having made the statement, now look, don't just believe me, don't just take my word for it, you check it up in your own Bible. You prove it in your own Bible. And we are here as a result of that commitment to the truth. I say we're here as a result of that uh, commitment. We're here because God called us, but God works through human instruments. And God began working through that human instrument to raise up uh, an end-time work. And he began doing so 
well over six decades ago. So there was a commitment to the truth. A commitment to the truth that came right out of the Bible and to take that truth and to make it clear and to make it plain. I would like for us today to look a little bit at how that legacy should apply to all of us, particularly by focusing our attention on the book of Romans chapter 12. And notice the first couple of verses. Because there is a there is something, we're living in a time that... Uh, uh, a time that the entire world seems beset with doubt and uncertainty. Uh, we're living in a time when there is a transition on the world scene, and the post-World War II order uh, has, to a great extent, passed away. There has nothing uh, really emerged to take its place. It is a time of instability, of unrest, and of uncertainty on the world scene. We are undergoing a transition in this nation right now, uh, many commentators have focused in on it, that we have, with the inauguration of a new president just a matter of a few days away, uh, we will uh, experience a transition to a post-World War II leadership. Uh, to uh, President-elect uh, Clinton will be our first president, uh, who was not shaped by World War II, uh, the, uh, was not... Uh, uh, a veteran of World War II was not someone that uh, was directly and personally impacted by that and a participant in the war. So, there is a period of transition that we are going through on the world scene and nationally. We have certainly uh, seen that uh, I think we, we need to be realistic. We need to uh, uh, to be plain and, and, and uh, understanding on these things, because we all know, uh, whether we uh, have spoken of it openly or not, uh, that we have gone through and have been certainly beset with uh, a lot of uh, uh, things that have impacted people even in terms of the church. We have certainly gone through and have been going through increasingly uh, a time that uh, uh, has left many sort of feeling uh, uncertain. Uh, how do you know what is the truth? And uh, we have to understand that many have felt that, uh, uh, that they're not quite sure and there has been uh, uh, there, there have been a lot, there have been concerns from uh, a wide number in, in varying ways and varying degrees. I'd like to call your attention to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, because I think they focus in on something that is a fundamental legacy of this work and in the way that Mr. Armstrong approached things, because all of us are a result of that labor of love that God began through him. And uh, this work was not predicated, as I said, upon some some vision or some special sort of revelation, but rather on his commitment uh, to the truth of the Bible and to realizing that the Bible is uh, the basis of truth. Not uh, uh, well. Let's let's just look here in Romans chapter twelve, verse one. Paul says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service." And be not conformed to this world. Don't attempt to fit in and to take your shape and definition from the society around you, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How can you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? How can you know what is the will of God? That is an important matter to focus upon, and I think it focuses in uh, at the very heart and core of things. Now, <clears throat> there are those of us, most of us here over the years, 
had to come to a point where we were convinced that we knew the will of God and we began to act upon it. I very well remember when I first began to confront the fact that God's will was quite a bit different than what I was in the process of doing. I had begun to read some of the literature, begun to hear the broadcast, uh, just originally sort of sporadically back in the uh, early and mid-60s. Finally, curiosity was aroused and a couple of booklets were written in for entitled, Who is the Beast? The United States and Britain in Prophecy. They sort of aroused my curiosity, but they really didn't, at that point in time, require me to do any particular thing. They made sense, they rang true, and after a few months I began getting the plain truth, and gradually began getting other literature, but about a year and a half down the road, I came face to face with the issue of the Sabbath. And if I had not been absolutely convinced that I had proven that Sabbath observance was the will of God, I wouldn't have started doing it because it was an awful lot more convenient to fit in in the small community where I was living, to fit in with my family, with my neighbors, with my friends. Far more convenient to fit in with all of them and continuing to go to the Taylor Baptist Church every Sunday morning. That was the easy thing. That was the convenient thing. And there's one reason and one reason only that I quit doing it. And that was because I came to the point that I was absolutely convinced I knew and I knew that I knew that I had proven to myself what was the will of God. And the will of God was that I was to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And I was convinced of that. And as a result, a radical transformation in my life began to take place. You know, there are points of truth you can learn that don't really require any specific response on your part. You may agree with them, they may make sense, and you may like it, but it doesn't really require you to stop doing or start doing a particular thing. When you come, there, there are elements of truth, though, that when you come to grips with them, they require a response on your part. You've got to do something. You've got to stop doing something you're doing. You've got to start doing something that you haven't been doing. And uh, it becomes the fact that a response on our part is demanded. Most of you sitting in this room came to that point in one way or another. For some of you, it was a very costly decision. For those of you who lost jobs because you came to a point that you were convinced that Absolute obedience to the Ten Commandments was the will of God. And because you were convinced of that, you stepped out and you did some things. Some of you have faced great problems from maybe family members or relatives or friends. Some of you have faced problems and difficulties with jobs. What does it mean? And how can we know that we have really proven what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? What does that mean and how can you know that you've done it? Because if you know and you know that you know that something is the will of God, you can step out in absolute faith and confidence and do it and know that the very God of the universe is going to be backing that up. Because God is God. And God is the creator of all that exists. God has power over all things. And when you step out to do the will of God, you're not out on the end of a limb. You're not out by yourself. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew when they told Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we're not going to bow down to your idol." They knew and they knew that they knew that they were doing the will of God. They knew that was the will of God. That was not the time to write in for the booklets, Does God Exist? and the proof of the Bible. You know, that was not the point to begin wondering. Now, let's see, what were those seven proofs? Uh, uh, hmm. Well, uh, wh where did you say that thing was? Uh, maybe, uh, uh, what if I bow on one knee? How would that be? 
So they stepped out and they were prepared. And, and you know, God could have delivered them at any point. God chose to deliver them after they were thrown in the fiery furnace. Uh, you know, they hadn't read the book of Daniel. They didn't know what God was going to do and how he was going to do it. And they must have been wondering at some point, you know, well, maybe, you know, he'll do it this way, and maybe he'll do it that way. And they kept getting closer and closer to this thing. And finally, they were shoved off into it. And on the way down, you know, the thought must have struck them that, uh, you know, I, I wonder what God's going to do. I thought, you know, he was going to do this or that. And then the realization must have dawned on them very quickly that, wait a minute, we're, we're, we're not, you know, the heat, it's, it's not taking our breath, we're not, we're not dying, we're not, our clothes aren't catching on fire. We're, we're standing here in the middle of a fire. Intense heat. And we're not even breaking a sweat. Then there was an angel that appeared there with them. They didn't know what was going to happen, but what they knew was they were doing the will of God. And if you are doing the will of God, you can have absolute confidence, even though you don't know how God is going to work something out. You don't have to know how God is going to work out the details. Nor do I. What we have to know is that God is God, and that we're doing His will. And if we know those two things then we don't have to worry about the details because God will take care of the details. Let's look here. You may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's look at these three words, good, acceptable, and perfect. And then I want to take notice of the word prove. Now, good simply means good. It's a word here. It's a word that just is commonly used in the New Testament to mean good. I think uh, everybody has pretty good, we all have a pretty good idea of what good means. Uh, so God's will is something that is good. Uh, it is defined here as something that uh, uh, possesses that quality of goodness. Acceptable. Now, this word is translated acceptable right here. In many places in the New Testament, the same word is translated well-pleasing. That's really the sense of it. God's will is what is good. It is also what is well-pleasing to God. And it is described here, perfect. The word for perfect uh, comes from a word that uh, carries the connotation of finished or complete. Uh, and, and it is sometimes used in the sense of maturity of someone who has come to to a mature point, to have, has come to a point of, um, it, it's, it's the term, for instance, that's used back in Hebrews when it talks about, uh, uh, I, I fed you with uh, milk rather than meat, because meat, strong meat belongs to those uh, that are fully grown, those that are mature, those that have come to a point of, of, com of, of completion in terms of their development. And uh, it, it is a... It's a term that sometimes is translated fulfilled. It's translated uh, mature. Uh, the, the sense of the word is that it represents the, the coming together or the culmination of something. So God's will is something that represents uh, a completion of, of development. It is something that is well-pleasing to God. It is something that is good. Now, when we say prove, we often think simply in terms of being able to look up a verse in the Bible or point to something. Oh, how, what does prove mean and how do you prove? The word prove as it's used in the Bible has a little broader context than, than what we often consider because we uh, usually think in terms of prove purely in an academic sense. But the, proof, the, the word prove in the Bible has a little broader meaning. It, it, is, uh, uh, it can mean to examine or to put to the test. Well, let me show you a couple of other places where this same word uh, is uh, translated 
by a different English word, yet it's the same word in the Greek language. It's translated prove right there in Romans 12 too. Uh, if you look back in uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse uh, 56, Jesus said, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you cannot discern this time? Now, the word discern here is the same word that's translated prove back in Romans 12, too. Christ told the people that, told the Pharisees, he said, you can tell the weather. You can understand and comprehend what the weather is going to do. You look at the sky, you see what's shaping up, and you can, you can grasp some of that. If we start having a south wind or a north wind or something, well, you know what's happening. You can discern these things. Why can't you discern? Why can't you examine from a standpoint of understanding the times? They couldn't grasp the reality of the times they were living in. They were, they were oblivious to what was happening around them that was far more real than the weather. It was, of course, the impact of Jesus Christ. So to prove has the, the sense of examining from a standpoint of understanding. It is not simply a one-point a one point thing that you look up this verse and you have proven it. The word prove, as it's used in the Bible, has the, the broader sense of, of the process of examining and, and evaluating and coming to an understanding or a conclusion. Uh, it is a word that is used <clears throat> back in Roman, or in Luke chapter 14, just a page or two over. It's used in a little different context here. Uh, this is the story of the man that... Uh, uh, the, the people that were invited to the supper, you know, the wedding supper, and, and uh, uh, they began making excuses. And... Uh, in verse 19, uh, one said, Well, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I must go to prove them. Pray to be excused. Now, he didn't mean he was going to go look them up in his funkin' wagnalls and see if they were really oxen. Uh, when he said that he was going to prove them, that meant he was going to put them to the test. He, was going to ex he wanted to examine and understand if they were really capable of doing what he thought they were. Uh, he wanted to examine and to put things to the test. You know, they're... Ways of proving, not only are we told to prove, but God does proving too. You know, God proves us. And uh, God is in the process of proving us, just as we need to be in the process of proving what is the will of God. And proving involves the whole matter of examining, of putting to the test, uh, of evaluating from the standpoint of coming to a conclusion. If we would like to understand how God proves us in terms of the Christian life, uh, we might notice back in the uh, uh, book of Deuteronomy. Here's why God dealt with ancient Israel in the way that he did. Deuteronomy chapter 8. All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do, this is verse 1, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these forty years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna and provided your clothing, as he goes on to say. And um, so... That is the way that uh, uh, God humbled them and God proved them. What does that involve? What was the purpose of the 40 years? God wanted to put them to the test. He humbled them. Now, humble them has to do with the fact that he put them in a situation where they were faced and confronted with their own lack of self-sufficiency. You see, true humility is based on seeing ourselves in proper relationship with God. If we see ourselves as we really are, if we see ourselves in proper relationship with God, we have a basis of humility. 
It's based on a recognition of our lack of self-sufficiency. We're dependent, deeply dependent upon God. But, you know, in everyday life, we can lose sight of that because we're doing this and we're going off and we're doing that and we're doing all these things and we make this plan and we accomplish that and we get to thinking, well, look what I can do. So God said in dealing with Israel, He said, first point is I'm going to get you out there in the middle of the desert. You can't provide water for yourself because there isn't any. You can't provide food because you got, you know, how are you going to grow food when you don't have any water and all you got sand and rock to grow it on? So you're not going to provide your food. You're not going to be able to manufacture clothing or obtain it because everybody else has enough sense to stay out of that desert so you can't buy it from them. And what are you going to make it from? I'm going to put you in a situation where you absolutely cannot provide for yourself. You can't do it. But I will. And you're going to have to recognize how totally dependent you are on me and how unable you are to sustain yourself. The next thing he says, I want to prove you. I want to put you to the test to see what is in your heart, whether you would keep the commandments or not. I want to put you in a situation and see what you will do. You've said all that the Lord has said we will do. You know, God allows us to go through our wilderness in the Christian life, finding ourselves, one, in situations where we're totally dependent upon Him. We can't work it out. And secondly, God allows us to be tested. He wants to know what is in our heart. It's easy to conform when there's pressure upon you to do so. Even if what you're conforming to is what's right. You know, it's easy to conform to the right if you're being pressured to do so and you sort of go along in order to get along. The question is not how many commandments you keep when it's convenient. The question is, what do you do when it's inconvenient? What do you do the rest of the time? What do you do when no one else is looking? See, God wants to prove us, to know what's in our heart. Are we obeying Him from the heart? Or are we simply men-pleasers? God wants to know. So proving goes both ways. God proves us, just as He proved ancient Israel. We're also told that we're to... uh, You know, they're... they're, uh, various places that uh, we could we could look and examine. Let's let's notice a little bit back let's notice in Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five and verse three it says, Not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. You know the word tribulation comes from a, a Greek word that means pressure. Something that is where there's a lot of pressure being applied. Uh, that's what tribulation is. Tribulation is a time of stress, a time of pressure. And there are various kinds of tribulation. We're not told that we'll be protected from all tribulation. We're told that uh, certainly there's a promise that the Philadelphia era of God's church will be protected from what is called the Great Tribulation. A time that far exceeds any other time of trial and stress and pressure that has ever occurred. But nowhere in the Scriptures are we told that we'll be protected from all stress, all pressure, all tribulation, all trials. Not at all. In fact, we're told that through much tribulation shall we enter into the kingdom. The kingdom of God is something that must be entered and it's something that must be entered into as a result of going through a lot of stresses, a lot of trials. Notice why. We glory in tribulation. Why? Knowing the tribulation, that this stress and pressure works patience. Works patience. Which has to do with endurance. And patience works experience, which is tested, proven Character. This word for experience here is a word that's derived from the same word that 
prove is in other places in the New Testament. So we go through stress and pressure, and that produces in us something, a quality of enduring, of enduring. That's where patience comes in, of being able to endure and to go through. And this enduring quality produces something that proves who we are and what we are. A tested character. And this tested character, the test that we go through and what is produced as a result, leads to hope. Because we see God's working in our lives and we see his encouragement over an extended period of time. And hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. So God proves and tests us. God also talks uh, about proving him. He says in Malachi 3.8, Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse. You've robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive. So God says, prove him. How how do you prove God? You prove God by stepping out on faith to do the things he said. We prove God by stepping out on faith, by trusting him. Proving God is not just merely an academic exercise of going to, uh, uh, you know, read a booklet or something. It has to do with Stepping out on faith to do what God says. Let's understand a little more about this word proving. If we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 28, we read, Let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. That has to do with with the Passover. Let a man examine. Let a man examine. Prove out. That's this word, prove. Prove yourself. Now, examine yourself. Examine from a standpoint of coming to a conclusion, coming to an understanding. We are to, we are to examine and to, so, to sort of look from a standpoint of trying to discern, trying to understand. We come on back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now, this word acceptable, we've already seen that in Romans 12 too. It it has to do with what is well-pleasing. Well, let's notice here in the context... Let's go up to verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Because of these things, the things he's just gotten through listing, comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not you therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes in darkness. There was a time when you didn't see, you didn't know, you didn't understand. You were sometimes in darkness, but now are you the children, are you light? In the Lord, walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving, putting to the test to discern and to really grasp and understand. To test out what is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now that gives us some insight, but let's go on back to a verse that's very familiar in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, where we're simply told, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Or we could say to examine and put to the test all things and hold on to what's good. Because we are to examine, to put to the test 
to prove out to find what? What is that good and well-pleasing and fully matured and developed will of God? So we're to prove it. We're to put it to the test. We're to examine it. And we're to hold on. To seize and grab hold of. And to hold on, to hold fast that which is good. You know, if you want to see that word hold fast, you can go back to the book of Acts. It's used there when, uh, it's, it's the word that's used when it describes Paul and the others. They've been at sea and there's been this, uh, this storm and they've all thought they were going to die. And they fasted. And, uh, uh, you know, finally the, the, uh, the storm subsides and they cut the anchors, uh, just, just cut the ropes. And, uh, it's, you know, they make for the shore. They, Hold fast. Seize for the shore is what it says. You better believe. I'll tell you what, if you've been out there and it's been storming three weeks and you thought you were about to die and all of a sudden the wind becomes and you see, uh, you see a little island and an inlet, uh, when it talks about, when it talks about what they were doing, uh, you better believe they put every fiber of energy and strength into pulling those oars. They wanted to get, they wanted to get to that island and they wanted to get their feet on the ground as quickly as possible. You know, it wasn't a casual sort of, well, you know, it sort of calmed down. They would just sort of sail around and look at the sea for a while. They wanted to get their feet on dry land. That's what hold fast means. It means grab hold of with no intention of turning loose. No intention of turning loose. So we're to prove out. We're to put to the test, to discern, to come to understand all things. Which, of course, tells us that things can be understood and discerned. You see, the truth is provable. The will of God is provable. If it weren't, God wouldn't tell us to do it, would He? Well, let's go on. Let's, let's understand. Let's look a little bit at the will of God. Because we've looked at proving out what is that good, that acceptable, that perfect will of God. What is the will of God? We've looked at sort of some of the peripheries and how do you prove uh, that proving goes beyond just uh, a matter of intellectual examination. But when you really get to looking at the will of God, what's involved? How do you go about proving out what is the will of God? Well, let's come on down. Let's go back to the book of James. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations or different trials and tests. Count it all joy to be tested. Now, I don't know that that comes naturally to any of us. I've never heard of students uh, that were all happy and excited when the teacher announced we're going to have a test. Particularly if it was a pop test. You know. All right, get out a sheet of paper. Uh, get out a sheet of paper, and uh, we're going to have a pop quiz. Oh no! Well, some of us sort of like that when God gives us a pop test. Oh no, we we didn't want a test. You know, can't we do something fun? Can't we watch a movie today, or or, or do something? Uh, uh, you, you know, we don't want a test. James says you're going to learn more from the test. Count it all joy when you fall into different trials. We're going through trials. Some of us are going through some real heart wrench, uh, some real gut wrenching trials in our own personal lives, with things that we're going through in our own personal lives. Problems with health, problems with uh, maybe family members in our family, mates or children or jobs, finances. Various ones of us are going through various trials and tests right now in our job. We're going through trials and tests in the church. There's no need to. Pretend we're not. The whole world is going through a time of stress and difficulty. James says, count it joy when you fall into these trials and tests. Why? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. It works something that endures. You develop something that has a lasting quality. Let patience have her perfect work, her complete 
Let this enduring quality bring something to completion, that you may be complete and mature and entire, wanting nothing in lack of nothing that is necessary. Now, if any of you lack wisdom, we find ourselves not really knowing. See, this is what we find. This is the problem so many times. We're not quite sure what to do. And we lack wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven to, driven with the wind and tossed. You not, we can't get anything from God that way. If you're going to ask God for wisdom, you've got to believe that God's going to give it to you. You've got to ask in faith. You've got to trust God to provide it. Now let's come on a little further. Let's go back a little further in the book of James. So we see that God is the source. We have to ask. The trials, God allows trials and tests for a purpose. The Christian life was never intended to be a life free of stress and trial and test. That was never God's intention. That has been the story of the people of God from the beginning of the Bible all the way out. That's, that's part of God's plan. It's part of God's plan of developing something in us that has staying and enduring qualities. Something that will stand the test of time. But you see, the problem is when we're in the middle of these trials and tests, we're not always sure. We don't see exactly how it's going to work out. God does. Sometimes we don't see exactly how we need to respond. We want to respond to God, but we're not sure exactly how. If you lack wisdom, ask of God. God is the source. Now let's go back to James chapter 4. Verse 3, it says, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. But you may consume it upon your lust. There are times when people ask and they don't receive because they already, uh, their, their, their motives are wrong. You adulterers and adulteresses know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know, we can't walk with God and run with the devil at the same time. It doesn't work that way. Fitting in with this world is incompatible with fitting in with God. Do you think the Scripture says in vain, the Scripture, the Spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy, it pulls us in that direction. But He gives more grace. God gives His grace, His beneficence is extended to whom? He gives more grace, wherefore He says God resists the proud, but He gives grace unto the humble. So a starting point. You see, we need what God extends God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. All that, work in, all that walk in pride, he is able to abase. You know, spiritual pride, an attitude of pride and haughtiness, is not a good stance. If we approach God that way, God's not listening. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How do you... How, how do you do that? Well, notice verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Deeply repent and humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift you up. You know, Psalm 35, 13, David says, I humbled my soul with fasting. How do you humble yourself? The primary tool that God gives us in the Scripture as a means to humble ourselves is to fast. That's not the favorite thing most of us enjoy doing. You know, we, we prefer feast days to fast days. But you see, how did God humble ancient Israel? He put them in a situation 
where they were unable to sustain themselves and they became very conscious of their inability to sustain themselves. We humble ourselves. When, we, when you start fasting, it doesn't take too long before you become aware of your inability to sustain yourself. You become conscious of your lack of self-sufficiency. See, we're told right here, and if you actually go through and count them up, you'll find out there's seven points. Your mind, your life, to God. Have to have an attitude of not my will, but your will. Resist the devil. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. We, begin, we have to begin really trying to get close to God. You know, God dwells in the light. And if we want to draw near to Him, we've got to come to the light of God's way. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. In other words, quit doing what you're doing. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So it's not enough simply to wash our hands, simply to clean up our actions. We've got to go beyond to the way we think, the way we feel down on the inside. To be afflicted and mourn. To really deeply repent and be broken up before God. Seeing how far short we've come. Humbling ourselves. Fasting. Prayer. You know, as we look through at proving out the will of God, we're looking at prayer, fasting, meditation, study of God's Word. Those things really work. Notice in Acts chapter 10, let's notice an example here. Someone that was seeking God's will. In Acts chapter 10, now, you remember the story. We're told in verse 1 of Acts chapter 10, that there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. He was a centurion of the Italian band, the Roman army. He was a devout man. He was one that feared God with all his house. He gave alms to the people and he prayed to God always. And suddenly there was revealed to him something that he was to do. You remember the story. He went to a house where Peter was. And Peter, in the meantime, had been given a vision that had left him perplexed and he unable to understand what it was talking about. And while he was puzzling over this, Cornelius' servant came and knocked at the door and, and uh, wanted uh, uh, Peter to come to his home, come to Caesarea. Now, in verse 25, we'll pick it up. Peter was coming in. Cornelius met him. Fell down at his feet and worshipped him. You know, he was from an area of the world. This was the way that they showed, uh, venerated someone that they uh, respected uh, in that way. Sort of a, a, a worshipful, superstitious sort of an attitude uh, toward, uh, uh, you know, Cornelius meant well. But uh, Peter quickly corrected him and told him to stand up. You know, that's not, uh, that's not the approach that we use. Uh, I myself also am a man. You know, don't, don't bow down to me in that way. Uh, so he talked with him, and he went in, and he found that they were come together. And Peter said, you know that it's not, it's not lawful for a man that's a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now Peter understood his vision. Wherefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for? Why have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer is heard. And your alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and Call here Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he's lodged in the house of Simon the Tanner by the seaside. And when he comes, he'll speak unto you. Immediately I sent for you, and you've done well uh, that you are come. We're all here present. 
before God to hear all the things that are commanded you of God. And so Peter then began to explain things to him. Explain God's plan and God's purpose. Now what do we see here? Cornelius was searching for God's will. Cornelius had over a period of time since he had been uh, away from Italy and had been in the area uh, of uh, Judea. Cornelius had come to understand and, and be impressed with some things about the God of Israel. He had come to an awareness of things that were vastly different than the superstitions and paganism that he had grown up with in Italy. All the gods and the goddesses and all of the, 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 the things that, that were a part of that culture and that society. Cornelius had recognized that those things were empty and hollow and that wasn't the solution. But he didn't know what to do. He So what did he do? He prayed. He fasted. He sought God. And he continued to do it over an extended period of time. He didn't say that he just did it for a few minutes. And instantly, God answered. Oh, God can answer instantly. And there are times that God does answer prayers instantly. But in so many cases, God is working with us because the trying of our faith works patience. An enduring quality, something that can endure and stand the test of time to produce in us a proven and developed faith. Cornelius fasted and he prayed. And he sought the will of God. And the time came, God provided that solution. And he did so in a way that was apparent. So one thing that we learn as we seek to prove out the will of God is that a starting point has to do with prayer and fasting, with drawing near to God. Drawing near to God. Really walking with God. Seeking to serve God, to draw near to God. To submit to God, to resist the devil. To examine and change what we're doing. And not merely to stop there, but to go on down to what we're thinking on the inside. To deeply repent of our sins. The things that cut us off from God. So it becomes a matter that We are to pray, to fast, to meditate on God's Word. We're to study God's Word. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, it tells us we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. I know that the word here for study... uh, means more than just academically looking up something in a book, but that is included in it. It has to do with conscious, deliberate effort, which certainly includes applying ourselves to the Word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Now, what is the Word of Truth? This book, the Bible. It has to be rightly divided. It has to be properly understood. Now, as we study the Bible, there are things that become apparent. We want to understand the will of God. Well, some things God states very clearly and very explicitly, and we build on those things to understand other things. For instance, Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, First Thessalonians 4, 3, this is, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, Paul told us in in Romans 12, 2, that we are to seek to prove We're to seek to really prove out what is that good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so we seek to really, we, we seek God. We seek God through prayer and through Bible study, through fasting and meditation. As we begin to study the Bible, we have God's will, God's will revealed to us. Now, here's a very clear statement. This is the will of God. You know, we like to find a statement like that. This is the will of God. Oh, okay, well, that's simple. Now, what do we do? What is the will of God? Even your sanctification. Now, what does that mean? You know, when you come up with a word that maybe you're not sure of, and sometimes even words that you think you are sure of, I find that a lot of times if I look up a word, I learn things about that word uh, that go beyond just what I knew or thought I knew. So it's a good thing to, uh, uh, in the process of studying that way, look up words in the dictionary. Sometimes they have a broader meaning than what we've realized. Um, if you have other translations of the Bible, maybe read that verse in several translations because Sometimes they will bring out more, uh, a more deeper or uh, uh, a more deep meaning or a fuller, a broader meaning. Now, this word sanctification, to be sanctified, means to be set apart, uh, to be dedicated or set aside for God, has the concept of holiness. Holy, because it is going to come in contact with God. It is designated for God. It is set aside for God. It is set apart for God. It is special to God. That's the, the sense of sanctify. So God's will for us, here's a clear statement. We want to prove out the will of God. God's will for us is that we be sanctified. That we be set apart. That we be set aside for Him. Now, we're told in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, We're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. For unto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we begin to examine this sanctification, we find that it involves something. How are we sanctified? We're sanctified of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So what sets us apart? What is it that sets us apart as dedicated to God, as special to God, as set apart for God? We're set apart, set aside by the Holy Spirit and by the word of truth. The belief of the truth. So our being set aside and set apart for God is predicated upon the truth. And it's predicated upon God's Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is what opens our mind to understand truth. That's why the truth clicked in your mind. You know, there are millions of people over the years. We talk, mentioned at the beginning of the sermon that all of us that are here are here either directly or indirectly through the work that God raised up through Mr. Herbert Armstrong going back over six decades ago. There are millions and millions of people who have come in contact with that work over the years, who heard the World of Mar broadcast or saw it on television, who read a Plain Truth magazine. Millions of people throughout this country and around the world that have come in contact with that, and yet there's only a handful here. Why? Because God took the initiative in the lives of certain ones. He took the initiative. Something clicked. It was like the the switch was turned on. All of a sudden, it made sense. The truth made sense. And you understood the truth. And not only that, you then had to respond to the truth. God took the initiative of enabling you to understand the truth. You had to respond to the truth. Because if you had resisted the truth, God may have continued to work with you over a period of time, but... Ultimately, we have to make a choice. We have to respond. The truth 
sets us apart. God called us to the truth. We need to understand that. That's why we, we understand, because God opened our mind. The Holy Spirit of God is the means that opened your mind to understand the truth so you could believe the truth. We're sanctified. Here, we've been chosen to salvation. God's purpose in calling us is so that we can be saved from the wrath to come and inherit life in His kingdom as a part of His family forever. And that is made possible through being set apart, set aside by God, through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit of God, and belief of the truth. Now, coming on down, you know, what is truth? Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, it's notice, He said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctification is tied in with two things. It is tied in with being set aside or set apart through the Holy Spirit of God and through the truth of God. Those things are what set us apart. They're what make a difference in our lives. Now, you couldn't respond to the truth if it weren't for the Spirit. The Spirit is what opens our mind. What man can know the things of a man except for the Spirit of man which is in him? We looked at that last week, you know, in 1 Corinthians. Even so, no man can know the things of God except for the Spirit of God. So God's Spirit opens our mind to understand the truth. Sanctify them through your truth. Your Word is truth. So where do we look for the truth? The Word of God. The Bible is the source of truth. You know, it says in Psalm 119, verse 160, Your Word is true from the beginning. All of it's true. You know, there are people that claim to believe the Bible, but they really don't. Because they don't take the Bible to be literally so. You know, they don't really believe that uh, uh, God's Word is true from the beginning. They want to take, uh, you know, God says that He created... Uh, Adam, and he, he uh, then he put Adam to sleep, and he took a rib out, and he made a woman, and he put them in a garden, and he called it the Garden of Eden. There are people that will read over that and say, well, you know, it didn't, it didn't really mean that. I mean, it wasn't like there were two literal people, it was just sort of God, uh, you know, a sort of a, a nice story and sort of a metaphor. And, oh yeah, we believe the Bible, you know, uh, but we sort of believe little bits and pieces through there. We find a nice verse we like, but we don't really take it literally. Well, we're sanctified through the truth, and the Word of God is truth. And God's Word is true from the beginning. If you can't believe Genesis chapters 1 and 2, you can't believe John 3.16. You have no basis, no, no, uh, no basis for knowing what is truth. God's Word is true, and it stands true, and it's sure. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we're sanctified, we're set apart through God's Spirit. We're set aside, we're set apart through the truth of God, our response to that truth. Why are we set apart? First Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, being set aside through the Spirit of God unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace be multiplied. We're set aside, we're set apart, through the working of God's Holy Spirit, for the purpose of obeying the truth, unto obedience, and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what makes possible our being cleansed and purified. So, when God begins to reveal His will, we're told to prove what is that good and holy and uh, perfect will of God. We begin to examine, to put things to the test. We find that we can set our hearts to really pray, to ask God. We lack wisdom. We're to ask of Him to do so in confidence. 
really seeking Him and fasting and prayer and studying God's Word. Now, how do you study God's Word? You know, they're, they're, we, we've been going through some things, but you know, there are wrong ways I, uh, of studying God's Word. And God talks about it in, in uh, uh, Paul writing to Timothy. I read some of these scriptures last week but I want to, to read them this week, and I, I want to use a little different translation. It's the International Critical Commentary, and, and they this uh, is uh, a paraphrased translation of, of this particular section uh, there in First Timothy chapter 6 and verses 3 through 10. And it really uh, sets it in modern English and gives the sense of it, as we are to study to show ourselves approved, as we are to uh, prove all things. Notice what it, notice what it, the warning that is given here by Paul to Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 3. I go back to the warning with which I began. If any teacher sets himself up to teach novel doctrines and does not loyally adhere to sound words, I mean words that come from the Lord Jesus Christ himself and to the teaching which is true to real religion, such an one's head has been turned. He has no real knowledge. He's like a delirious patient, feverishly excited over this small point and that, fighting with words as his only weapons. And the result is envy, strife, abuse of other teachers, ill-natured suspicions, incessant friction between men whose minds have been confused and who have been deprived of the truth they once knew. They've come to think of religion wholly as a source of gain. Paul had to contend with those who approach things in the wrong way. As he wrote to Timothy, he gave Timothy some guidelines. And these were preserved in the Scriptures for us. And the Apostle Paul focused in, as we all need to, on the trunk of the tree. On focusing in, in that way, on what is fundamental. And, of course, ultimately, our understanding that is brought out right here, that God, what is fundamental? What is the fundamental will of God? It is that we be sanctified, that we be set apart, that we be set aside for God, that we be transformed in our minds through the working of God's Holy Spirit to be made conformable to the Word of God, that we are to conform not to the world around us, but to the Word of God, we are to take the Bible as our means of testing and looking and seeing and examining. Back in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 14, there's another paraphrase from the ICC uh, commentary that uh, on these verses that I think, again, really sums up the flow. We went through it uh, in a uh, more familiar fashion last week, but let's, let's look at them this way because I think it just gives a little fresher feel to it. These are the central truths of which you must remind any to whom you entrust your teaching. And you must charge them as in the sight of their Lord and Master not to be word warriors constantly arguing and wrangling with words as if they wish to ruin rather than to build up their hearer's faith. Such wrangling is perfectly useless. With regard to yourself, take all pains to present yourself before God as one who can stand His test, as a real worker, as one who will never be put to shame for bad or scamp work, but as teaching rightly, the one message of the truth. But to all these irreligious and frivolous hair splittings, give a wide berth. Those who take part in them will go forward on a downward grade of impiety. Their message will be like a cancer eating into the sound members of Christ's body. 
To that class belongs Hymenaeus and Philetus. For they have entirely missed their aim about the truth, explaining away the literal resurrection and saying that the resurrection, that resurrection is only our past resurrection with Christ in baptism. And thereby, they are upsetting the faith of some. Yet be not alarmed. Whatever false teachers may say, the solid foundation of God's temple has been fixed once for all. And on it are two inscriptions carved first by Moses and renewed by our Lord. One tells of God's knowledge. The Lord knows them that are his own. The other of man's duty. Let everyone who worships the Lord depart from iniquity. Yet within the church, there will be great varieties. It's like a big house in which they're not only vessels of gold and silver, but others of wood and earthware. Some for honorable, some for mean uses. If then any teacher keep himself quite clear of these false teachers, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart for service, ready to his master's hand, prepared to take part in any good work. Or as the King James says, sanctified for the master's use. But that you may be such a vessel, you must turn your back upon all merely youthful impulses and passions, you must set your face toward just dealings with others, towards loyalty, love, and peace with all who call the Lord their God out of a pure heart. But these foolish discussions with men of untrained minds persistently avoid, you know they only engender strifes. And as Isaiah said, a servant of the Lord must not strive. No, he must be courteous to everyone, apt and skillful to teach, ready to bear with contradictions, speaking in a gentle tone, as he has to train the minds of opponents. He must always have in his heart the hopeful question, may it not be that God will give them a real change of heart, and they will come to a real knowledge of truth. May it not be that they will come back to their sober senses, saved from the devil's snare. May it not even be that I shall be a fisher of men and save them alive and bring them back to do their true master's will. Provides a sort of a modern language paraphrase, and yet one that is faithful to the spirit of the text. We're focused in on our relationship to God, the way that we are to walk in our daily lives. It is possible to prove out, to examine and come to a valid conclusion of what is the good, the well-pleasing, the maturely, completely developed will of God. It's possible to know that. Simply put, God's will for us is that we be sanctified, that we be set apart, that we be set aside for Him. That involves being set aside through the Spirit of God. That involves being set aside through the truth of God. Fitting in with God. With God's law. We're sanctified unto obedience of the truth. We must respond to God's initiative. The servant of the Lord must not strive. The solution to the problems that we encounter do not come from carnal wrangling. The solution to the problems that we encounter must come from a unity of the Spirit of God. First and foremost, we must unite ourselves individually with God. Being followers of God, drawing nigh to God, realizing God will draw nigh to us. As we go through whatever periods of trial and testing that we face, whether individually, in our own personal lives, whether collectively, as a church, recognize that is simply one more of the trials and tests through which God's people must pass. Because not only must we prove what is the will of God, God must prove some things about us. And God is proving some things about us. 
If we lack wisdom, then what we need to do is to ask of God. And to diligently and faithfully and fervently ask of God and to realize that God doesn't always simply snap of the finger. You just ask the question and instantly there it is. Well, you go through the scriptures and you find many examples of where over a period of time God's servants sought God's will through prayer, through fasting, And they looked to God and they trusted God. And God provided their deliverance. He provided the solution. God's will is knowable. We must ask. We must seek. But brethren, we have a promise. If we really genuinely draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to us.